you're about to enter into a new world of knowledge, curiosities, and high strangeness. This is a podcast of Straight Up Strange Productions. You're listening to Mysteries and Monsters. I'm your host, Paul Bestel. In his latest book, Rogue, author Luke Phillips takes us to Washington State. As a series of brutal murders envelop the area, it seems that something out of the ordinary is occurring, and cryptids are at the heart of it. Luke joins me to discuss his fantastic fourth book, some of our favourite Bigfoot films, and the true accounts he references inside the pages of Rogue. But before that, as always, don't forget you can support Mysteries and Monsters by signing up at patreon.com slash mysteriesandmonsters. $4 a month gets you ad-free episodes, guaranteed a releases, bonus content, and more. You can also click the link in the show notes as usual. Thank you to each and every one of my patrons for your continued support. Mysteries and Monsters is across all social media platforms. Please subscribe to the Mysteries and Monsters channel on YouTube. You can also visit mysteriesandmonsters.com for news, episodes and Mysteries and Monsters merchandise. Our intro and outro music is performed by the amazing Weary Pines. Thank you to Dean Bestall for his marvellous artwork. The show is produced by Brennan Storr of the Ghost Story Guys and Mysteries and Monsters is delighted to be a part of the Straight Up Strange Network. The mountains and forests of Washington State harbour a secret. It has remained hidden for a millennia. An apex predator that has mastered the art of the hunt. Intelligent, savage, destructive, and now gone rogue. It no longer sticks to the shadows. The hunt is on, and we are its prey. On today's show, it's a warm welcome back to author and another lover of cryptids, Luke Phillips. In his latest book, Rogue, we are taken to the mountains and forests of Washington State. And I think you all know what is lurking in the pages of this incredible new book. Luke, welcome to Mysteries and Monsters. Well, thank you very much, Paul. Um, Thank you very much for that wonderful welcome. That is uh, uh, a praise above and beyond. Thank you. You are very welcome. As we've spoken for several years, you've been a, a wonderful supporter of my show and been very kind to me over the years i was so looking forward to this subject as i'm sure you probably guessed due to my (laughs) due to my addiction to all things bigfoot and i was blown away by rogue it is one of the best non-fiction books i've read in a long time luke and it is easily one of the best books i've ever read in regards to monsters and strange creatures, you should be chuffed to bits, as we would say with this. Uh, that's that's very kind. Uh, I mean, obviously, I probably should point out it is it is fiction, but um, but it is based very strongly on um, um, you know, uh, 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 on legends and lore of the Bigfoot world, and the support is very much two way, Paul. You know, I mean, you've always been very kindly had to have me on the show. Um, but I've loved the show from the beginning. Um, your interviews are fantastic. Uh, I, I literally just listened to um, uh, your interview with Andrew McGarl um, two weeks ago for uh, uh, Beasts of Britain. Um, you know you, the way you answer questions and, and looking, you know, look into these things. It's it's just gripping stuff. And it, 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 many of the interviews you've had have set me on the path to, to writing stories. So it's uh, it's a two way street, and I owe you a lot. So. No, oh, thank you. Thank you very much. So, this is a bit of a departure from you. You've obviously hit this with your fourth book now, Luke. So, obviously, the first ones were, were more in regards to what we spoke about last time when we were talking about mystery big cats and strange creatures of that ilk. Whereas this one, as I've said in the introduction, is set in Washington State. This is clearly a love letter, I think, Luke, as you mentioned about the legends and lore that surround Bigfoot. Along with Max Brooks's marvellous devolution that recently came out as well. This is clearly something you felt very passionate about, that you've made sure that you've treated, even as we said jokingly there 
allegedly this is a fiction book, Luke, I'm not too sure, <laughs> but there's clearly tons of research. You've got a love of this subject anyway, so you kind of know the the Easter eggs we would be expecting for anybody who's a lover of Bigfoot. What was the genesis of this? Why did you decide to pivot away from cats killing everybody <laughs> to, <laughs> yeah. to everybody? Well, one of everybody's favourite cryptids in the world. Well, uh, Bigfoot's always been there for me in the background. I mean, I, I, I mean, this book is dedicated to my dad, who, yes. um, when I was very young, allowed me to sit down on a rainy Sunday afternoon and watch uh, The Legend of Boggy Creek, mm -hmm. which scared the bejesus out of me. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, so, yeah. Uh, and I think the actual the scene of the hands coming in through the bathroom, <laughs> I think, literally stayed with me from early childhood right till now. Yes. You know, uh, you know I, I, lit I cannot think of a more compromising and more scary thing than having a Bigfoot reach through the window whilst the, you're uh, so compromised. Um, <laughs> but, but, but yes, so the love has always been there uh, and I've listened and read and always been, you know, uh, even into the controversial subject of you know, Bigfoot in Britain. Um, but uh, for me, you know, when I was at university, my love was for big cats. Um, I went down a real rabbit hole in terms of trying to explore and disprove the fact that big cats were in Britain and then basically ended up convincing myself that they were here. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I kind of have been on a similar journey with Bigfoot, but over a much longer time. Mm. Um, you know, as I say, I, I, you know, I, you know, I, I watched, um, the Legend of Body Creek, um, Creature of Black Lake, um, <laughs> obviously Bigfoot and the Hendersons, um, you know, uh, you know, things like that. Um, plus, you know, a whole plethora of, um, of other Bigfoot movies, um, including, you know, Abominable and, you know, a few other 90s sort of, you know, sort of, you know, big hits as such. Um, and I think it, for me, it was always a case of, so devolution was a real pivotal point for me as well, in that Max Brooks is such a, brilliant author um mm. you know you and i have both just you know discussed our love of um world war z yeah um and you know he you know his treatment of, of the zombie uh, apocalypse you know is completely different from something else and the same goes for devolution which is very much set set about around bigfoot in mount rainier national park uh but for me again where it missed was there this is this the rabbit hole that you go down when it comes to Bigfoot is so deep and so long and goes off in so many different directions. You know, we've got, you know, stories of, you know, you know, Osmond, you know, being, you know, taken in his sleeping bag to supernatural Bigfoots and Chestnut Bridge and paranormal experiences and such a wide plethora of things to explore that it, 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 treating it just as a, a, a monster in the woods almost isn't giving it its full due. And what I wanted to do was write a book that answered all of my sort of, you know, uh, deep imaginations in terms of what a Bigfoot could do and, you know, what it potentially could do if it was, you know, a, a nasty one, but also really envelop some of that lore and legends into it, you know. So, um, and there's, Easter eggs planted throughout the book, which hopefully any Bigfoot um, aficionado would, would be able to pick out fairly easily. So, <laughs> Yes, I have to say, I started getting quite worried about how much I've invested in Bigfoot, Luke, because <laughs> one of the early scenes is the sheriff types in a, a, a code into, into his phone in regards to uh, what's going on. And as soon as I saw the code, I thought, that's the that's the date. Patty was filmed. <laughs> it's exactly, it is, it's Patterson Gimlin. Yeah, so his code is 20, 10, 60, or 10, I yeah. don't know how the Americans do it, but I can't remember. Yeah, it's the opposite to us Brits, but yeah. it's, it, it, yeah, it's, uh, it's 20, 10, 67, which yeah. is it, the, you know, the date of the, the, the Patterson Gimlin film. Hmm. Um, so yeah, and, uh, that particular, you know, um, uh, uh the, the chapter before that is called Bigfoot and Hendrickson's, um, you yeah, know, so which uh, sort of hints at both Bigfoot and Henderson's very lovable film where and also everybody in that chapter, the family, 
have the same uh, have the names of the actual actors who played yes. <laughs> the, the Bigfoot family. No, sorry, the, the the family of the Hendersons. Yes. Um, so there, there's lot there's lots. Of, I mean, that's just the first chapter, I and mean, I, I, you know, I've, I've shared that online, so people won't won't be giving too much away, hopefully. But there's stuff like that all the way through, and yeah, you know, it takes a couple of jabs. At, um, you know, there's a TV crew for something called Seeking Sasquatch, which isn't perhaps a, a, as subtle as it could have been, but um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yes, there, there's stuff like that all the way through. Um, but it really does explore sort of, you know, what a 10 foot ape could, or, you know, let's say it's an ape, what a 10 foot, you know, animal hominid, you know, creature could do. Um, because I think that's, and one of the things I do go into in one of the chapters is I explain how strength and musculature um, increases with with size, mm -hmm. um, and how something that's twice the size of a human is actually four times as heavy and nearly eight times as strong. Mm -hmm. You know, um, yeah, but just if it was able to walk upright, it would have to be. You know, so yeah, um, yeah just because of biophysics. So it, yeah, it, and it's stuff like that that I, I really wanted to explore. Yeah, what could this thing do? You know. Uh, and uh, also, I wanted to give some biological, you know, potentially biological, uh, you know, sort of explanations to some of the things they do. So, you know, I, I've, I've given it the, you know, the same kind of um, hair properties that we see in birds like kingfishers, which have um, sort of, you know, light c consuming sort of hairs and particles. Um, I've given it the ability to, you know, uh, regulate its heat signature, things like that. Things that we can, we've seen, we, we see in the biological world for real, that might account for some of the stranger stories we hear about Bigfoot. But mm. there's a little bit of woo in there as well. So. <laughs> well, I think it is, as someone that's been quite precious about the cultural versions of, of Bigfoot that we've seen over the years in both print and on film, Luke, I have to say, I, I, I'd kind of tended to, away from it all because similarly to you, I remember, I don't know what it is about the toilet scene in, in The Legend of Boggy Creek, but that was the bit that terrified me because I went into that film completely unaware of, of what it was because it was shown here at like six o'clock on a Friday evening, the first time it was ever shown in the early 80s. And I think the week before they'd shown King Kong so right <laughs> you know you sit down on a on a friday tea time to watch a, a monster film and you you don't think that two hours later you're going to be absolutely terrified as a nine-year-old it's the same as snow beast the original snow beast which i now love oh. because it's rubbish but it's wonderfully brilliant rubbish oh i i, I again an absolute favorite uh, yeah. i mean my dad was heavily into his ski you know he was a yes. ski instructor when he was younger and um you know uh, we we absolutely all love that film as a family but again it, yeah when you look at it now it's awful but in such a good way. I yes. mean, yeah, you know, I go back to Snow Beast so often. So, yeah, 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 um, yeah. The things I've learnt about Snow Beast, I know at the bit where they're all in the in the school gym, one of the main characters actually falls over and breaks her arm during that scene, which is why she doesn't really, really which is why she's not hardly in the film afterwards because she <laughs> broke her arm and shattered a collarbone, I think. So, My word. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, and people fall down and the hat flies off and then it cuts back to them and the hat's back on. I mean, it's just full of wonderful <laughs> little gems like that. <laughs> it is. But again, what, what I like, again, one of the, I think it was probably, Snow Beast probably has a lot to answer in terms of my writing style because there's, there's, it, I think for me, one of the things that was terrifying about Snow Beast is when it regularly cut to the creature's point of view. Mm. And you had that really heavy, growly breathing, yes. you know, and it's stalking. I mean, you know, how it managed to clamber up onto people on skis um, <laughs> at, the, at, the, at the lumbering rate it was going and still managed to catch them is, is kind of amazing. But, um, <laughs> but, but. But, you know, it, you know, you had that aspect, like, you know, the girl who plays the reporter, and the well, woman who plays the reporter, um, you know, and she's being stalked through the woods. You don't see anything, mm. but you're, it's terrifying. It's, it's a bit like, you know, Jaws, you never see the shark, and then when you do, it's slightly disappointing. But, mm. you know, the, the, the build-up has been quite something. Mm. Mm. I think it, it took me a long time to kind of settle on, the, a film that I thought was the first one that would 
that really made me think, mm, actually, this is probably one of the best attempts at doing this kind of thing I've seen. And when I first finally sat down to watch Willow Creek, I know some people say it's a bit of a strange film or it's a bit of a, a, a hard watch. But I have to say, it's, I would consider it a slow burner because the first 45 minutes you're dealing with this Bigfoot obsessed goon who's I don't think you'd kind of guess just how unprepared he is for the reality of what he dreams about. And it's one of those where you've got little clues all the way through it, like the missing people posters yeah. here and there. And you're thinking, mm, I mean, I've watched too many horror films, so I'm, I'm always as soon as I see something like that, I think, right, when are we going to come across that being resolved? <laughs> um, mm. But that, I think Bobcat Goldthwaite, of course, who who was the director of, of Willow Creek, I think that was a very similar thing because he's he's also somebody who who holds this subject very dear to him Luke and you can tell that in the final half of the film because I didn't expect to feel <laughs> scared as I did because I, I I'd like to think I'm quite I wouldn't say immune there are, there are certain films I've seen over the years that have that have left a, a nasty taste in my mouth Luke but and uh, there are some films that have shot me to my car and I never want to see them again not because they're <laughs> bad films but they've just made me think oh you know like American Mary or Irreversible oh. um, so <laughs> so the last bit of, of Willow Creek is for me i thought was was astounding because you've got all this bit where the camp's getting trashed and they keep hearing things and you've got the bits flying about and all this and it just you you, you can sense that the situation is spinning wildly out of control and they've no idea just how bad it's going to be oh no i totally agree and yeah it does, i do think it gets it gets a little bit of flack but uh, and I, but it, i found myself at the same crossroads you know because it's very difficult to look into bigfoot in 2023 and ignore all of the claims about the supernatural or the weird and the woo you know because you know so if you do go off in that tangent and explore it a little bit i think you know people should be forgiven because you know we can't just you know at the end of the day this is an animal we've never we haven't caught we don't know it's out there we have nothing to really support it so we can't say this report is or this you know, encounter is more likely than this one because at the moment it's kind of a lottery anyway you know, it, it, you know anybody could be telling the truth um and obviously some of the even the wildest claims have come from people who seem you know very genuine very scared had you know some you know very very you know trauma-like sort of symptoms and they clearly went through something and I, and anyone who criticizes willow creek i dare them to watch that tent scene and then go camping yes you know, and, you know, <laughs> you know, drop them off into the you know the screaming woods of uh pluckley and uh <laughs> 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 with with a, with a two person tent and see how they get on straight after watching that scene. I think you know, you'll be a, be a be a braver person than me. Yeah, <laughs> that's very odd, Luke. Because I was watching a program about Pluckley last night and it was talking about the Screaming Woods. Have you got cameras uh, in my house? No, I haven't. No, but being Kent based, <laughs> Pluckley is not far from it. So, um, so around about this time of year, it becomes a very favourite haunt. So, yeah, uh, no, oh, literally no pun intended. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes so uh, willow creek was the one that kind of made me think well perhaps i need to be a bit more that and then about three weeks after that i saw exists which just blew oh. me away because i thought right here we are we've we've got peak bigfoot film here i think which is quite odd for me because i'm not a massive fan of the blair witch i have to say i think I, th I think it's one of them it was so hyped at the time when it came out that i think any most people would feel a, a, a tinge of disappointment um i think with it and i know obviously i think there was more more shots of someone's snotty nose than i was anticipating in that particular <laughs> film luke i was hoping the witch had just come and wipe her nose never mind do yes, anything yeah. else to them um so I, I, I kind of thought, well, you know, Willow Creek was miles better than I thought. Exist just blew me away from the beginning where he's being paralleled through the woods on his bike. And you just think, oh, um. yeah, no, exists is great. And, and I have to admit as well. So exists just the the poster that exists yes. with the, the arm and the claws, you know, um, you know, coming down. I mean, again, that's that. I mean. I haven't watched Exists for some time, but that has 
absolutely stayed with me, you know, for some time. And there was a relatively low budget one, I can't remember recently, which kind of went along the same lines where there was a a woman who is a serial killer and she hits a a Bigfoot, a baby Bigfoot, and then basically whilst she's also preying on lone hikers, she's got to keep up this, you know, audio defense around her house because otherwise the the bigfoot will come in for revenge and then one of her victims eventually works it out and you know to switches off the defense system and the, the bigfoot comes in and does her, her dirty work for her oh. so, you know, yeah it's, it's a really good I it's one of those really good films i can't remember the name <laughs> of them. But, um, yeah, but uh but yes it's uh yeah, there's there's so many out there where they they explore these actions and it, again exists where again you it's not a bad guy because you're you're seeing there's a reason why this animal is so you know motivated the way it is and obviously if we're talking about you know uh, intelligent animals you know the more we go into this the more we we, we are finding in the real world that this happens you know mm-hmm. yeah we do have animals that appear to hold grudges you know there's yes. this wonderful story out of uh you know siberia oh yes years ago, uh, with a tiger that yes. literally tracked down the poacher that had you know called him he wasn't there so he trashed his house then lay down in the snow for three days waiting for the guy to come back yep killed him and ate him that wasn't good enough tracked the guy back to a work, a, a quarry he was working at, and destroyed a toilet he had used. Yeah. You know, I mean, you cannot tell me that wasn't, <laughs> it didn't do that for fun. That no. was, that was, that tiger knew what it was doing. Yes. And again, you know, at the moment we've got this bizarre situation where we've got killer whales uh, yes. attacking boats in, in Gibraltar. And it appears that it is the matriarch that, that is, has taught them how to do it. And mm-hmm. it's been surmised that she's had a bad encounter with boats or that they've associated boats with the, 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 the lack of their food source. Mm-hmm. And, they've de- and they've decided how they've worked out how to disable boats by taking out their rudders. Yeah. You know, yeah. that, you know, so when we when we start attributing apes with the level of the same level of intelligence, which they do have, mm-hmm. uh, you know, where they could take a, a, a grudge and and take a grudge quite seriously. Um, right, you know, we're not in the realms of fiction. No, not at all. I mean, I had to chuckle because obviously I'm always interested in weird stories like this. And so the last orca attack occurred on Halloween, which I think yes. shows a, a deep sense of humour, never mind anything else on the whales' behalf. <laughs> well, I like that they gave it a little break and then attacked again on Halloween. I mean, yes. if that isn't, if that isn't uh, <laughs> deliberate, I don't know what it is. Yeah. And it opens up possibilities because I had um, Max Hawthorne on recently and we, and we, we were... We touched on this particular subject because obviously Max has done a lot of um, sea-based horror in regards Absolutely. to his yeah. Kronos Rising series of books, but also his experience as a you know as a as a top-level fisherman as well. Indeed, and, yeah. And so we were we were kind of postulating if these guys are doing it where they are off the off the uh, Iberian Peninsula around uh, the, the the where the Mediterranean meets the Atlantic and so on. It it. it, it opens the questions is how is this happening in other places around the world and if it is happening in other places not everybody's going to be as close to the coast as no. these people have been is this a situation where boats have disappeared in the past that this has been going on because as you say because these creatures have got intelligence which we often arrogantly presume is nowhere near to to matching ours and yet we can continually see across all the animal kingdoms the level of intelligence and specialities that seem to just appear it's one of the you know like why does salmon know how where to go back to spawn why do turtles know where to swim or where to lay their eggs even though they've never been there these are these are the questions that make you wonder about this and then when you look at creating this kind of tapestry that you have in regards to rogue we've got all this in, all this information your personal experience of, of, of studying zoology as a younger person luke and your love of, of subjects to see what goes on around us in the world i'm often perplexed as to why people seem to be very surprised when we see creatures developing or being finally seen to be shown just how intelligent they are across the world 
I think it was I, 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 I think it comes down to dogma and stigma, to be honest. I, 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 you know, I think when you look back just 200, you know, 150 years ago when Darwin was you know, postulating the, the theory of evolution, obviously we couldn't possibly even you know, contemplate that animals might have you know, deeply rooted, in, that they might feel emotions, that they might have you know, intelligence in, it, in a different way that we do. You know, um, you know, you're not going to call them to, to sort out your plumbing, but at the same time, you know, <laughs> they, they have a, they have a, they have a, a, an intelligence that's for, for, that we don't in terms of a mas- being masters of their natural environment. Um, and we like, we know with whales, for instance, and dolphins that they have these incredibly strong, you know, sort of emotional bonds. They have a part of the brain that we don't because the, the neural uh, processing, you know, that they use to process emotions is 20,000 times stronger than ours. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, so they have a level of uh, bonding and kinmanship that we can't even contemplate. Mm-hmm. Uh, and again, and it's interesting you say that about where it's spreading, because we now know that uh, a, a, a case has happened in Scotland or a, 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 a boat made it to a port in Scotland and had had the same. Yeah. And also in the Isle of Man, uh, a, a, a guy came into a harbour in, 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 in there and had had the same thing. He'd been attacked by orcas. It was a relatively mild case. They hadn't obviously, you know, uh, put his boat out. But it was interesting. Both those boats were sailing boats, and they once they kind of realised what they were, they left them alone. Mm. You know, the fact that they seem to be specifically targeting fishing vessels is is really interesting. Yes, absolutely. It is remarkable, really, and and even even like we've just been saying, I'm not surprised, but I also am sometimes that. It just shows you how, as much as we study creatures of, of very different abilities and on land, air and the water, often these things could have been going on for, for generations. Because this, the other thing, like you say, you know, they're, they're, they're considering that maybe the matriarch has, has taught them. But what if she hasn't? What if it's one of these weird muscle memory things that some animals have that you just cannot comprehend unless they're able to talk about it? Or, or they've got secret animal libraries where they can go and research things, Luke, that we once again are unaware of. How some of these things get passed down because it just baffles me. Oh, I totally agree, and I and I do think it is very arrogant to 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 presume. Yeah, I, I think we always try and look for a logical explanation, and we go, oh well, you know, well, you know, it must have been the mayor truck. She's done this, and you know, or this happens because that makes sense to us. But it's a big assumption, and it's assumption based on no evidence. You know, that it's just, it makes sense to us, mm. but we we don't know what's going going on in their heads. We don't know how it's being communicated. We don't know how many animals it's it, you know have taken up its behaviour. We don't even know if they are using their form of language to uh, explain this behaviour to other pods and it's spreading like wildfire. Mm. You know, um, so we don't know. We don't know any of that. No, not at all. Not at all. And it's certainly um, it's a it's a very interesting aspect. I mean, orcas especially, I think, over the last 10 years have kind of gone from being considered as as some kind of sort of opportunistic predator to now being shown to be the actual dominant predator in the sea, because we now know that they're hunting great whites and great whites will get out of the way. They don't want to be anywhere near where an orca pod is these days. And people have seen them being stunned and then their, their livers and, and such like are being taken by the, the orcas. And now we've got all this in with the boats. You can only you, you can see just even in, in our modern history, just how quickly they've gone from being run of the mill to the top of the food chain. Yeah, I, I, again, I think it's one of the things that we fell into when it came, comes to taking them into captivity. Mm. We've kind of kidded ourselves that these are affable, lovable animals. And because there's never been a recorded incident in the wild of, of, a, of a killer whale, tracking down and or hunting humans um you know uh they you know we we tend to presume that they're not they're not as dangerous because you know again arrogantly they, mm. they don't seem to be a particularly big threat to us mm. but you know uh when uh just off the coast of you know uh, there was a a, a a great white was attacked off the coast of uh, san francisco 
um, and by killer whales. And the other great whites in the area fled something like, I think it was something that was, the furthest one went was 3,000 miles. Mm. I mean, that wasn't just, well, we'll, 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 yeah, we'll stay indoors for a bit. Yeah. You know, it was, we're getting the hell out of Dodge. Yes. Yeah. You know, and again, we're now seeing that in South Africa where yeah. we've got these two killer whales in particular that have learned to kill great whites, take their livers. You know, we've suddenly got great whites which have been hanging around this area for a very long time, for generations, who have literally fled the scene mm -hmm. um, and have gone thousands of kilometers um, to avoid being in the air. Uh, uh, and only tentatively beginning to return. Yes. Um, so, so, and, and, and again, and obviously for years, you know, a great white shark was the big bad, but killer whales are definitely, um, you know, you know, they, you don't mess with. And the other thing as well, people don't really, unless you've been somewhere, we, we obviously we don't have them. We don't have aquariums here that have dolphins or orcas anymore, but I'm old enough to remember going to Windsor Safari Park to see the killer whale that they had there, who was Winnie, the killer whale who, um, and I've, I've actually seen Tilikum, um, you know, at San Diego, um, when, whilst he was still alive. People do not realise how big these animals are. Yeah. You know, we're, we're talking 30 plus feet for the biggest males. Mm. Um, and you know they can dwarf a great white shark. Yeah. You know, um, you know their dorsal fins are six foot. My dad is six foot. Yes. It's like <laughs> you know people do not understand the size of, of these animals and what they're capable of. I mean there was wonderful footage recently um, of one chasing down a dolphin and it's not even trying. Yeah. You know, and dolphins are fast. Even though they are known as killer whales, they're obviously part of the dolphin family, which is one of those strange names that I think we're... It is, <laughs> yes. Yeah, well, they were called that because they were the whale killers. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. That, 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 I mean, uh, I mean, they, you know, that, that's what they did. I mean, there's, we're spending a lot of time on killer whales, but... Um, <laughs> But there was this wonderful story out of the 18th century where there was this pod of killer whales that used to call the sailors, you know, would literally gather in this harbour in Australia and take, you know, and basically tell the whalers to get a move on, um, you know, because there were whales out there and they would share in the hunt. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's 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 phenomenal stuff, you know, when you think that that level of intelligence yeah, and you know, what they're capable of. But, yeah, they're they are the absolute wolves of the sea. You know, mm. and, they, and you know, having said, you know, killer whales have never hunted or killed humans, um, you know, obviously that we know about. You know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to say if one of those comes for you, Luke, you're not really going to be around to uh, tell the tale, I suspect. No, absolutely. And, and again, it's interesting. A lot of the wildlife cameramen, you know, they'll get in the water with the killer whales in California and South Africa and things like that. They won't get in the water with them um, in Antarctica. No, you know, because they know because the ones in Antarctica do not know that we're we're not to be messed with. Yeah, they don't know the rules. <laughs> <laughs> they know they don't think we're we're not seals. I think. Yeah, yeah, they, they, I don't think they can tell the difference, and I don't think anyone's willing to test it. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose as well in in Rogue, as we were saying about you dropping some Easter eggs in. Were you conscious of looking at some of the more notorious and allegedly deadly encounters? over time that we've heard about or people have speculated about i know probably one of the most famous ones which is seems to have been rediscovered over the last few years i know there's been a few interesting documentaries about this particular area <laughs> shall we say well, I, I know exactly where you're going to talk about now <laughs> which is portlock port, um, portlock yeah or I mean, port chatham as is, is, is also strangely called yes indeed yeah so I mean, absolutely. For me, Port Chatham had to be in there. Um, again, probably a little bit as a knee-jerk reaction um, because of said interesting documentaries. Um, because I think, you know, they haven't treated it necessarily with the respect, you know, that, that it kind of deserves. And again, I'm not, I'm not sure. I'm in love with the, you know, that we have to always crowbar this supernatural element into into a story, you know. So when you look at the, the story of the hairy man and Port Chatham and Port Lock, it's scary enough on its own yeah. without adding sort of voodoo and, uh, and other aspects into it, in my opinion. Mm. Yeah, you know, you know, when you look at this story as uh, an aspect of, um, you know, uh, that 
over you know, since the late 1700s, this area in Alaska has had numerous different you know sort of populations try to settle it say this place is amazing there's food here we can survive the winter here it's a wonderful place to set up camp and then to basically abandon it almost overnight uh, in some cases you know uh, it, it you know it is really really creepy mm. um you know and in particular you know uh, the, the situation in the 1950s where we've got such a strong record of what happened Mm. You know, where over, you know, sort of, you know, several years, uh, this Port Chatham was, was built. It had a, this wonderful fish cannery. Um, the salmon were running. It was wonderful. It was a community. It had a great school. And then, you know, they were hearing things at night and then they had to keep a curfew. And then some of the goat hunters went missing. And then somebody's machinery got mixed with and then a dog, dogs went missing and all of the time this force that they don't recognize is coming closer and closer to town mm. and then you know what ends up happening is the cannery is broken into you know and on the third occasion so much damage is done it, 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 a significant fire is started you know um you know and it's just built up this wonderful legend uh, and this sort of uh you know, idea of this having a very hostile population of Bigfoot living in this area who, you know, since the 1700s have basically been saying, you know, this is our area, you are not welcome here. And some really quite savage attacks. And, you know, one, one, you know, one guy in particular who they felt had been killed by, the, the only way they thought was that his machinery could have, he somehow got caught in his machinery. Um because the, the attack was so savage that they, they they either thought something had you know picked him up and thrown him into his machine, his logging equipment, um, or he had basically been beaten to a pulp. And mm. obviously, the mo what what most people think is he was basically beaten to a pulp. Yeah. Because there there didn't seem to be that of what the machinery just didn't seem to be the cause of death. Um, and again, even recently, you know, after the Port Chatham was finally abandoned you know we've had reports of there was a you know three campers three uh, hunters were in that area and had a terrifying ordeal where they were basically uh surrounded at night uh, and you know their tent was rushed multiple times they were hearing these deep you know growls and things like that and you know they they got out of there as soon as they possibly could um yeah, so and, and, and in that, you know, I do obviously mention it in the book and lay it out quite boldly because I, I do find it a fascinating story that has gone out, you know, for you know, over, you know, as I say, over 200 years now. So. Yes, absolutely. I think it is one of those things. I mean, if, if you look hard enough for some of these strange incidents or, or deaths of people in specific areas, there's a very odd one in the Bennington Triangle um, where a chap was found essentially crushed to death under a tree. Yeah. Um, and nobody could explain it. I think they were saying when they did the autopsy, every single rib in his body was broken. And you just think, well, what on earth caused that? And and you think, oh, well, maybe... And you start thinking, well, maybe a bear sat on him. Really? <laughs> what? <laughs> it's been a bear sat on him and squashed him to death? I think that's pushing the bounds of credulity in, in any strange thing because usually you know with the greatest respect a bear's not going to turn down a free meal and he he wasn't bitten to death he was crushed to death yeah uh, and again what's what i do find interesting is if you if you start looking at how apes behave, mm. one of the ways that they do attack and show their strength is in you know what we you know what we would call a bear hug yeah they they want they get their arms around you and so that they can get in close to a bite to the head and or to the neck and, and cause quite serious damage to the face yeah that's yeah. that's one of the ways particularly gorillas when they're in territorial fights but also chimpanzees you know just generally you know when they're being more aggressive um you know that's how they they, they act they want to get their big strong arms around you and they want to sort of you know get in close so they can do some damage mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well when i was reading the early chapters because the book goes from naught to a hundred in about three chapters <laughs> luke and um, this poor chap who disappears on a hike earlier on 
because I don't like, as I said at the beginning, I don't want to spoil too much. So we'll we'll we'll, we'll tantalise people with the beginning more than anything else. Mm. Obviously, he loses his life by having his head popped off. And as soon as I read that, I yeah. thought, ah, is this is this a nod to the, uh, once again, pardon my pun there, Luke. Um, is this a nod <laughs> to the Nahani Valley? incident it, it, it is exactly that and yeah I, I didn't get to sort of get Truman's and and, and the, you know, the, uh, the the Bellman Bigfoot in there but it, it, you know in name but yes it's very much that uh, but again it's it comes into these these there are several reports of the and in fact when I was doing my early research yeah one of the things I wrote down was why are they removing heads uh, and are they potentially blood drinkers? You know? mm. um, because, you know, there are so many reports of particularly, you know, especially once you start going down the road of the, the missing 411 reports, which, you know, we know uh, those bodies are going up Israel, not to say it's big four, not so well, you know, generally. But in some of the cases where the attacks or the things seem more animalistic, mm. If we assume that there is some kind of bigger creature behind them, a lot of them are missing their heads. Yes. Or they have, you know, quite serious sort of attempts, you know, of attack the neck or the things like that. You know, a lot of times the body is found, but they don't find the head. Mm. And obviously, I understand that part of that is because the heads are actually relatively easy to remove yep. once, you know, we're not living and you know and things like that. But you know, it, it is a, it is one of these things that crops up. And again, you, I don't want to ignore the evidence. I don't want to ignore the reports. You know, there is this aspect of, uh, you know, that that it does happen. And as you say, you know, the, you know, the Headless Valley, the Nahini Valley, you know, is, is one of those sto- stories which you don't have to go far into the world of Bigfoot before you encounter. And it, it, it's fascinating. Mm, it is. And I've always found these bits intriguing because it seems that you've got if we are to believe that this creature exists across where it's supposed to exist it it for me it's quite striking that you've got reports from say alaska and sesquatchewan and other pockets dotted around north america especially and um, where there seems to be very very aggressive territorial behavior whereas certain other areas such as British Columbia, Washington State, Oregon, things seem a bit more chilled out. Um, I once heard somebody say, well, that's probably because of the amount of marijuana that's grown in those particular areas, (laughs) probably chilling Bigfoot out. Who knows? It may be something as daft as that. But I find it odd that you've got these pockets of of very aggressive behaviour, because what went on in the Headless Valley, I don't care what anybody says. These are very ritualistic vicious attacks for someone to be decapitated i know one particular case the two of the guys they were found in their bunks and their heads had been pulled off and it you could see the blood that hadn't been cut they'd been pulled so pulled yeah once again people go oh well it was probably a bear what just eating a head what uh, what, since when have bears started doing that no exactly and that's i I have to admit that's when i begin losing patience with with the rationality you know yeah because it's i think you've discussed it on your your podcast before it actually takes a greater leap of faith to believe that a bear was pulling off hairs you know heads than it does that there might just be a bigfoot around (laughs) um yeah it's yeah you know, because it's sticking to the the straight story as such you know mm. in in the absence of evidence but also in the absence of just decent logic there is no way a bear is going to a turn up you know a three meal they turn away a three meal but also they don't attack in the way you know, that they would remove heads and things like that um so it's one of those things to really keep in mind and, and to yeah absolutely we can dismiss bear attacks because that's not we you know we know unfortunately how bears attack and what what it looks like so it, it, it it's not those it's certainly something else and um, you know and, and you know as you said as i say there's more than what you say there's more than one incident where we know because of the blood pattern and because of what happened we know that these heads were pulled off you know this wasn't a mad you know accident yeah. you know these were the physical strength required to detach you know a head you know, from someone who's alive is is i i would you know i uh, i would say it's beyond most men if not all <laughs> yes yes i mean even though the, even the ability to beat somebody to a pulp 
regardless, Luke, is something that very few humans would have the ability to do and and it not no, be noticeable. I... No, I totally agree, and, and that's the, and that's the thing. I mean, I've I've I, you know I've been in very few fist fights, if any, um, and certainly when I was a kid. But hitting someone once is enough, and you go, God, that hurt my hand, and I don't yes. want to do that again in a hurry. And it, it's it's to to you know the, these guys who fight for a living and things like that. You know, you, you can normally tell that they fight for a living because they look like hell. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, or you know, and you know, even they you know even if they're built like the uh, the proverbial outhouse it's you know there is still you know it is it takes such discipline and uh mindset and you know uh, other things to be in that area you know, to be in that sort of place where it's even a possibility i just i just think we need to think yeah it's probably something else mm. Mm. yes very much so i think as well it's powerful in regards to how this situation in these particular areas has become so well known that it's it's usually people who aren't from the area who say oh, these these local stories these first nations people these these native americans what are they talking about it's all superstitious and nonsense and they all stay away from these areas luke and say uh, bugger this we're not going up there there's a reason it's called headless valley we want to keep yeah. ours off you go mate no, you go find that absolutely. gold <laughs> Again, you've absolutely nailed it, Paul. This is the thing that's, I mean, it's kind of amusing to me. I mean, and it is kind of become almost a trope, like with these TV shows, <laughs> you know, where, where, where they sort of, they turn up in some native village and, they, you know, they show them pictures of things that they have literally spent their entire lives catching, tracking, being around. They probably know more about their natural history than, than we could ever write a book about. But then you get these Western TV presenters turn up and go, oh, are you sure it wasn't this? And they go, no, it definitely wasn't, you know, because we ate that yesterday and, you know, we sort of cooked three of them, you know, last week and we've been hunting them since we were four, you know. So it, it's just one of those things that, and as you say, this local knowledge, you know, like the Headless Valley, where you go, we're not going there. You can if you really want to. You know, may your God be go with you. Um, you know, we'll clear up after you when you <laughs> when you when you're back if you get back. Yes. Um, uh, you know, it, it's it's it, it is one of those things, and it's perplexing. Um, you know, that that we have ignored these areas. I think, and again, you know, like our good friend Shannon Legro has said, you know, you know, some of these are, uh, you know, they're a bit like people in, in terms of some are good and some are, you know, you know, you know. Uh, uh, aren't going to be go out of their way to harm, um, whereas you know others are just a holes, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and uh, and I have no, I have no problem understanding that in a in a capacity of, of animal behaviour. You know, we do see different personalities. You know, uh, you know, you know, when we're talking about sort of you know why some animals are you know more aggressive than others you know we, we 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 you can put two animals and give them you know similar areas and similar experiences and they will turn out differently mm -hmm. because that personality plays an aspect i think one of the interesting things that is you know because obviously i keep my ear to the ground in terms of just overall animal attacks and things like that and i do think we are seeing a, a an increase in sort of human wildlife conflict you know, in the real world, if, you know, to sort of, you know, quote unquote, you know, and part of that is because of human encroachment. Mm. We're going places that we haven't gone before and our population is growing and we're going into areas that we weren't before. Um, we're diminishing resources um, and, you know, we're sort of, we're, we're, we're sort of, you know, competing for, for both habitat and food. Yeah. And, you know, some animals take that very, very personally. You know, like, so if you look at, you know, I think, um, you know, there was a, 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 not too long ago, they had a, a problem with a, 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 a leopard that was preying on dogs yes. in a particular uh, district of Delhi. And so they set out these traps um, overnight and they caught eight. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so, and they had no idea these things were there. And, uh, but again, there's, we're seeing more and more conflict. We've, we've had, you know, leopards walking into factories, mm. um, you know, because they can smell, again, interestingly, you know, given Port Lock and Port Chatham, you know, they can, they can smell the food being processed. Yeah. Um, 
it's really interesting to me the number of fishermen who report Bigfoot encounters. Yeah. You know, you know, again, and, and again, that there is, even with the Native Americans, there's been this association of fishing or leaving out fish for Bigfoot so yeah. that they leave you alone. And when that's not, you know, kept up or not complied with, you know, these animals getting quite aggressive and hostile, mm-hmm. which again, we do see in, you know, with other species, you know, where, where you, know, partic- you know, for instance, bears in Yellowstone, where they've become acclimatized to being fed. So their next leap has been to start breaking into cars, but also to start harassing people. Mm-hmm. For food because they've learned this is the way to go times that into a creature that's 10 foot tall and weighs over a thousand pounds and has the strength of eight people I, you know i don't you can get a very pleasant experience no not at all and it just shows you the adaptability that despite all these constraints and pressures on certain species they find a way to to make it work for them like you say um, i remember seeing some incredible footage from india as well where they were in a field they were looking for a tiger and the incredible piece of film where this guy was on top of an elephant and they were looking for it yeah and it just appeared it just literally it's like it's on a spring it just boing and just yeah. whacks him straight off and it must have jumped i don't know 15 feet straight up boing yeah so i think in that particular that, i mean that again that's a very famous uh you know bit of footage and they, they had darted that tiger <laughs> um, and they were waiting for the sedative to kick in <laughs> yes. uh, and and they couldn't see it and yeah they claim it it leapt 14 feet and <laughs> the, the, the and what they don't tell you is that the mahout who was on top of the elephant he lost two fingers yeah just to the claws it literally sighted him down to the bone <laughs> uh yeah again you know very famous bit of footage you know and it just shows what they're capable of um but and again i do i tend to think with these apex predators they have they're the ones that have the most to lose Mm. so they tend to be the ones that will that you know they will they will fight they won't go quietly into the night they will fight for their territory Mm. they will fight for their food resources because but also they tend to be the more intelligent animals because obviously you have to be smart you know when, when you've got a kill rate of you know say one in ten which is fairly good average for most predators uh you know you've got to be smart you've got to be cunning you've got to know if you're upwind or downwind you've got to know how to blend in you've got to know how to stalk you've got to be patient you know you've got to do all these things and all of those things you know, are linked to intelligence so it doesn't surprise me that with when it comes to apex predators we we see them having the smarts to adapt and to live alongside us a bit better than other animals and um, because it's it's you know it, it's kind of how you know cats and dogs became you know close to people because it, it was in their interest snakes again in india you know, if you were looking for snakes in india a good place to be is near houses because they go after the rodents yeah yeah so there's all of these you know sort of real world examples of apex predators very happily setting up home alongside people and adapting mm-hmm. um if they're allowed to but obviously it comes it does come with the potential of hostility absolutely and and again i think we've been we've underestimated underestimating animals is something the human race has done for very very well for a very long time yeah we'll probably continue doing it for some time yeah i mean even in india you look at that as you say snakes are attracted to humans because of rodents but that also then attracts cobras because cobras yeah. eat snakes and therefore Absolutely. a lot of people in india in, in in a lot of the rural areas whilst they have a healthy respect for a very dangerous creature as the as the cobra is they know that if they just let the cobra get on with what it wants to get on they'll be fine and they'll be a lot better off because it's getting rid of every other snake absolutely yeah incredible yeah incredible and it just it just shows you once again they all think oh well hang on a minute why is everybody going there oh well i i know where i can get free food really it, it, it is and, and as i say there are plenty of, of good examples of you know that sort of symbiosis where you know humans and wildlife can get on you know yeah we've we've seen it on you know bbc wildlife where dolphins and fishermen in florida you know working together and like i mentioned the killer whales working with australian whalers although that's not not as not not as you know peachy a a picture to paint but um yeah we we do we do know it happens um but obviously you know uh, i'm more interested in telling the tales of of where it's uh, a lot more uh, more dangerous (laughs) Mm. i think one of the key aspects of the book as well luke is it's a bit of a departure for for books of this particular nature is that we also get the point of view of the creatures 
which is not something that most people would be brave enough to tackle because I think as we were saying you 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 may see it occasionally if you're reading books about legendary monsters such as vampires or werewolves where we try and create some semblance of intelligence or try and create a a familiar setting that we can all appreciate they just happen to be talking about bloodsuckers or vicious creatures that can transform into into bloodthirsty monsters and yet you you've got some incredible passages in this book where we're we're taught about what they do and and how they react to that and why they're doing what they're doing and what one thing is doing it's the dynamic of that i think is what one of the key reasons why i love the book so much because it's it's elevating it from it just being a story about people to everybody being a fleshed out character in this book regardless of what species they are well thank you very much i mean it's it's certainly something i wanted to do i mean i mean anyone who if yeah, if, my, if my readers will know that in the cat books, um, you know that the books are partly told from the creature's point of view, mm. and and a, a lot of the reasons I do that is is for the reasons you've just said. In that you know it, it's to flesh out the character, it's to show the side, you know, the animal behaviour that is really important to me. That the behaviours that are being reflected in the book are actually reflected in in what we know of what goes on in the real world. So my cats act like big cats and my you know sort of my bigfoot creatures act like you know very intelligent ape-like potential human sort of you know, relatives uh, but at the second part of it as well was though when i was fleshing out the book and looking at how i wanted to sort of draw these characters as such there are so many aspects in terms of there were so many you know sort of uh concepts like how are they going to communicate why are they doing this what are their motivations um and ultimately it comes down to you know something simple like you know villains don't know they're villains you know uh yeah they, they villains always have a, a reason they're doing something mm. and they always have a motivation and, and they think that they're the right they're, they're doing right you know um and uh, you know one of the challenges was how do i express that and ultimately, the, the way to do it was the same way I'd done it with the cat books, which was to tell parts of the story from the creature's point of view. But that also gave me the opportunity to incorporate the behaviours. Like, so, if, if, again, if you've ever listened to, to or looked into the Bigfoot subject, you'll be aware of things like the, the samurai chatter, the Sierra sounds, you know, that sort of stuff. So the, this concept of language is something that's been around in terms of, um, you know, for a long time in the Bigfoot world. We know that, you know, gorillas can learn and chimpanzees can learn sign language and they can express themselves artistically. Um, you know, uh, so there were all of these ideas and uh, that I wanted to incorporate into, you know, my Bigfoot. You know, they, they, this, they were going to have the same sort of, you know, behaviours and attributes as apes, you know, you know, particularly chimpanzees and uh, bonobos and, you know, again, another, you know, mystery ape, you know, the billy apes. Yeah. Um, you know, so, uh, you know, I wanted them to have behaviours that, that we associated with these, you know, the, the, these biggest of, of, of the ape family. Mm. So I suppose as well, Luke, because you've got this love of this particular subject, was it a difficult decision to leave, as we've mentioned, certain famous incidents over the years? Was it difficult to kind of not try and be too scattered in regards to the touch points you're using for, for, for the lovers of this particular subject in the reality of the world in comparison to the book? It was, and I think what I had to do in the end, I had to basically just limit myself geographically. <laughs> like we were saying, you know, uh, and, and again, you know, I had plans for a sequel because when I was looking into it and, and making accounts, researching my favourite stories and the the same, the reports and what cropped up and what were the, the, the trends in the reports, there was enough to fill out two or three books of quite you know rogue is the longest book i've, ever, I've written so far mm. and it could have been longer because it, there were so many stories and so many aspects to their legends and to you know just you know we we explore very you know a couple of you know ideas in the book like you say port chatham comes up um you know and the beast of the lbl which i know is a different cryptid but that comes up as well and a few other things because they do go hand in hand with Bigfoot. Uh, and again, 
people who know Bigfoot, th this was going to be a love letter for them, so that they that so that the the stories that they know, their favourites that have come up time and time again, are, are in there. But there's definitely not room to put all of them there in one volume. So the the, the sequel is going to be called Southern Rogue. Yes. Uh, and will you know take us down into Louisiana and uh, you know sort of a, that sort of area. Um, and, and again, you talking a little while ago about how we get these different reports, and we have, and, and again in in the South we tend to get these reports of far more aggressive. Yes. Effort, which um, it sometimes is, is attributed to the weather, yes. <laughs> which you know it's so hot and humid, and there's you know mosquitoes you know big enough to carry away small children, and you know all of those aspects, which it, it could well be. But again, it's such a an incredible idea that I, I, you know I can't I, I can't not go there. So you know, and, but the South has an entirely different Bigfoot culture, and you know, and this is something that's explored very well in David Weatherly's books as well, where mm. he's gone to the different states and taken these different accounts. You can see that there are these cultural differences, um, you know, and even has become popular, you know, where we have these four types of Bigfoot, you know, which are, uh, are described as having different appearances. You know, in the East, it's very human-like and almost like this sort of pro-Magnon, you know, Neanderthal man-like with, you know, slightly hairy appearance. And then in the South, we've got this chimpanzee-like sort of animal, you know, which tends to be found in more, you know, in, in, in larger groups and, you know, potential colonies. Then you've got the two bigger types, the the type ones and the type twos, where who are you know the, the sort of the stereotypical big 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 foot as such, you know the larger taller versions, with you know the ones found in Washington and Alaska being the biggest, and then the ones being found in Montana and Wyoming and places like that being you know slightly smaller but of a similar build. Yeah. So you know so we have got these you know this diversity and I know Cliff Barrackman you know he says no there's, there's you know we've just got you know variation it's all one species. Uh, again it's kind of a big claim for animals we, we, we've not yet captured and catalogued. <laughs> um, but you know but it is interesting that, that we have these trends in reports that allow us to make these differentiations in how they're described and how they appear and you know again behaviors you know that seem to make sense to where they are um geographically and biologically you know for instance florida's you know skunk ape which mm. you know make make sense that it, this one black character which has you know this strong matted hair has a smell um, you know very similar to you know the, the infamous food monster yeah, I mean, the skunk ape is something that I find fascinating and I hope one day to be able to do a proper show about it. And I know Lyle Blackburn's brilliant Monstro Bizarro show that he's been doing over the last year or so. His most recent episode, he's done a two parter on the whole skunk ape mythos, because I think when you look at somebody out there, you've got obviously for me, David Sheely is the guy I always associate with with the skunk ape. It's like lyle you would associate with a funk monster it it, it yeah. just certain certain investigators or or uh authors you you tend to associate with specific creatures like you say david's work is incredible especially all the stuff he's done with the woodnox books because the great aspect of those is he doesn't just focus on what's going on in north america he's got contributions from around the world which really gives you a, a, a flavor as to how stories in regards to the orang pendek and the yeren and the yawi and the almas and the yeti and things like that it just shows you that yes they are similar but they all seem very different and i think when you look at bigfoot in north america you as you mentioned there luke you can differentiate between the behaviors of the southern compared to some of the north and obviously the other pockets that we've we've touched on earlier there does seem to be a real difference in how they are and i know when i've seen particular interviews with witnesses in regards to the southern creatures there does seem to be a real trend in towards that they seem to be far more aggressive encounters that people are having compared to these kind of very normal <laughs> if you can say such a thing that somebody may have in, in washington state where they see them just wandering around um, I'm trying to think which state it was. David Weatherly had a brilliant witness report, which was one of the first ones I, I, I'm aware of, where a group of witnesses were watching a, a family unit playing. Oh, yes. Um, 
It wasn't Georgia, was it Peach State Monsters? It might be. It wasn't, it's not the last two books. It's the one, I no. think it was the one preceding that. So it might be the Georgia one. But that again is, is a remarkable thing because we see that kind of behaviour in apes, especially in chimps and, and, and gorillas. There's a lot of play as part of learning and growing and developing their own personalities. And if we are talking about such creatures, I'm amazed we don't get more of that. But then again, it's probably one of those situations that... If we are to believe that these creatures are as intelligent and territorial as possible, they are not going to put their offspring in situations which could be dangerous. No. Uh, and I think as well, you know, sort of the world, the, the digital world, you know, has spoiled us to a certain extent. You know, we, you know, we turn on our television and we see, you know, uh, you know mountain gorillas, you know, playing as as with families and, you know, making friends with, you know, David Attenborough and broadcasters and things like that. And I'm very lucky to work for a conservation, uh, you know, organization and charity. And, you know, I know the real world doesn't work like that. I know that that if you want to go and see gorillas in in Rwanda or Uganda, you know, chimpanzees in Uganda, you know, it's, it's a two day trek into the jungle and then you've got to wait for them to maybe turn up. It's, that we we don't get exposed to that you know so we, we think that the, these things are just out there and you know we can just you know turn up and take a picture and things like that and that, that you know the amount of work that goes into discovering you know insights into wildlife behavior and you know a species we, we, you know, we're discovering things about even animals that are commonplace every single day because we don't know enough about them and because actually you know recording and, and exhibiting their behavior is, is rare they, you know, we, you know they, we, we don't get to see enough of it I and mean, there aren't enough people out there studying it is it is one of those things where obviously most of the time if you if you if we don't you know when people say oh why didn't you go and take a picture or something like that i will say to people right you get in the car and go to scotland and take a picture of a pine martin <laughs> yes. i've done it I, yeah that we know that there's you know ten thousand pairs of of Pine Martin in uh, so it, you know, in Venice here, off you go. I, I want a picture by tomorrow. You, you're not going to get it unless you go to a very particular hide, and even then, it's very unlikely to turn up. Um, yeah, so it's it's very very difficult, and you know even the animals that we know, like wild cats, and you know even a fox, you, you know hmm. you know just even setting out, uh, you know, to go out and take a picture of a fox. Most foxes will run. Um, you know, when they see a human, taking pictures of everyday or recording everyday animals is is really difficult um, yeah. and quite challenging. So I have no doubt. And and you know, when you expand that to bigger animals, you know, to the tigers and lions and wolves and bears of the world, um, you know, you have to spend a lot of money and be in the right place to get pictures of those things, or incredibly lucky. You know, it does happen. And I think that's exactly what happens with these things. You have to be incredibly lucky. Um, and in the right place. And, you know, or, and most of these things, as I said, it's interesting that, you know, so many fishermen report, you know, encounters at night. You know, and, and what's happening is quite often is the Bigfoot is coming in and taking the, pi- the fish that they've, yes. they've already caught and have put <laughs> in a little pool somewhere or on a, on a line. And these Bigfoot have learned to come in and take fishermen's, you know, catch. And again, I find that really interesting that, that, you know, because that's a behavior that one, we find relatable, but also two, is believable. You know, that makes perfect sense. You know, an opportunistic predator could easily learn to do that. You know, there are bears who have learned to do that. Yes, absolutely. As Jeremy Wade famously encountered, I think he was in Alaska. And then he, yeah. all of a sudden a bear just pops up and goes, oh, I know what you're doing here. I'm just going to hang yeah. out. Right. <laughs> Everybody go. Go, go, go. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> and. One of the other brilliant things about this book, and there are numerous ones, Luke, is is our hero in this, our heroine, Nina Lee. <laughs> yes, Nina, yeah. What a character. Um, I mean, like I say, when I got to the end and I saw, when I turned it over, and I, as you've mentioned there, we've got the sequel, I was delighted because it's it's great that you've, that you've taken the time to create a proper, you know, we've got a strong-willed, native american woman who's who knows what's going on and people are saying oh no i'm you know dealing with both strange creatures in the forest it's uh yeah i mean it it was one of those things that i again struggled with at first because i think it's very presumptuous for a for a male a a guy to write a female character and do do it justice Hmm. um but i just felt 
it, she was the right person. She was the right, you know, she was the right character for the job. Um, and I felt it was, you know, it had to be told from her point of view because there were other challenges. Yeah. And, and again, I've kind I've already done, you know, the Indiana Jane stuff with, with, you know, my, in my previous books, you know, yes. um, you know, uh, uh, yeah, the, uh, Thomas, you know, is very much a, 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 an old school sort of reluctant hero sort of type. But also I wanted that Native American connection to, to, to Sasquatch and to Bigfoot. Mm. Um, because there are so many stories and so many cultural uh, in, in inferences uh, and associations with this animal. And, you know, and again, you know, one of the things that's really, that, you know, really stood out in my research and, you know, people have probably seen in documentaries they've watched, you know, when Native Americans are depicting Bigfoot, that most of the time on a totem or in, you know, art, they're depicted as real animals. Yes. You know, there is a, a fine, you know, there is a, a, you know, a definitive line between the animals that they consider to be spiritual and the, the animals that they consider to be, you know, real mm. and, you know, probably 70% of the time, in, in certainly in the research I was looking at, which might have been biased because I was looking for certain things, mm. the, the tribes I was looking at referred to these things as, as real animals. You know, they were not, you know, in the same class as the Thunderbirds or, you know, some of the, the gods or the otter men and things like that because they encountered them on a daily basis and they, they knew to be scared of them and they knew that they might come and take your women and your children or they left them fish offerings or they knew not to go into that valley or they knew not to go into that area of the woodland. It, it, so there, it was really important to me that, that, that I told the story from a different angle, but also from an angle where, you know, there was this vulnerability in terms of, and Nina is definitely not a damsel in distress. There was no way I wanted to go down that route because I think that would be very <laughs> hypocritical. For, for, for me, as a man to write a, you know, a damsel in distress, I think that would be a, a touch too much. Um, so I hope I've done it justice as a man writing a, a, a woman character as a heroine. Um, but, it, you know, there was this aspect that actually a woman in law enforcement, you know, having other challenges other than, a, you know, a killer animal on loose <laughs> but also there was the, you know part of the aspect is that she has a history with this you know with these creatures um and again that's where the vulnerability comes in um and again one, one of the things that i've already had people feedback to me is that the um the the song that she sings as a child is is something that people found particularly haunting and scary. Mm. Um, yeah, I had one guy in America tell me that he had read that bit whilst he was actually sat in a deer stand at night, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he had he hadn't enjoyed it very much. Um, so yeah, which I was good where it's done its job there. <laughs> uh, but yes, there there was this aspect that I wanted her to you know to have this this story to tell um and i didn't think a guy could do it if i'm being honest so so yeah that's the route i went down i mean was it a conscious decision to choose her tribal heritage specifically luke or did you look at the well-known tribes in that particular area or was it a case of looking for tribal law that leans into bigfoot and the sasquatch particularly or did you just think well these are these are the the the, the nations that are in that particular area that would be her heritage yeah so i i, I do give her a mixed heritage because she, she nina turns up as character in my third book um, phantom beast first yes. and her mother is crow um, um uh, and i know i've mispronounced that but um <laughs> uh, but uh there is a uh, yeah but th yes in terms of her father's heritage there was stuff i want there was a bit of fun I wanted to have in terms of his name uh, in particular um, and things like that. But also, yes, it was very much this is going to take place in Washington state. It has to be she has to have a heritage linked to these, uh, you know, these tribes because they're the guys who have had these encounters, you know, the river people and things like that. Uh, you know, so, yeah, it, it kind of all worked together uh, as an amalgamation. But in terms of her father's heritage in particular, um, yes, I chose the, you know, I went in the, he, he, you know, he was chosen because he was a resident of that area. Um, you know, the, the reservation he lives on is a fictional one, but it's based on a real one. Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, the, uh, uh, and again, with her 
her mother's uh, heritage in in Phantom Beast, uh, I again chose that one because it was in the story. It was very important um, that uh, they had an almost matriarchal society, but also there was this aspect of this relationship with nature that they had, um, which again was very important to the story. So that, that that's that's kind of why I went down those particular routes for her heritage. Yeah, I have to say as well, I was not expecting the plot twist later in the book because ah. I was I was I was very much enjoying this sort of conflict between humans and, and Bigfoot. And then you just throw in something else that turns up, Luke. Was that, <laughs> as, as, as we were joking before we started the interview about reading my mind, it is, a, it is a situation that I have often contemplated over the years. What if two particular cryptids encounter each other? Cryptids encounter each other. Yeah, I, I mean, again, I think that was what was going. But uh, you know, I, I can try and intellectualise it, but I think basically that's what that's what was going through my mind as well. Um, I think it's a okay. yes. So there is a mystery cryptid that turns up later on in the in the book. I'm sure people can probably guess, given they know <laughs> some of my preferences in terms of horror films and so forth. Um, but I, I won't say what it is. But there was also this aspect of is the enemy of my enemy my friend? Yes. And, <laughs> you know, you know, and I was like, well, actually, we have so many stories of Bigfoot being hunted. You know, we've quite like, you know, so the, the caliber most people say that, you know, they, they, they talk about though, is a 30 art six. You know, they said that, you know, which is a powerful gun. And we've got so many stories of, Bigfoot being shot or, you know, taken around or, you know, sort of flinching, but walking it off, basically. Mm. Um, and I was like, so what could, if we can't take it down, what can? And, you know, and I have, uh, you know, it, obviously there have been a bit like what we were talking about with great whites and orcas earlier. See, I knew there was a reason we were talking about. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, uh, uh, yeah uh, there was, you know, it's these conflicts between apex predators that I think fascinate us the most. And it's also, it tends to be, uh, it, it, whether it's us taking down another animal or these sort of legendary conflicts between, uh, uh, you know, one apex predator and another, those are the things that, that's you know it, those are the ones that tend to be the fights to the death because they won't back down because they have so much you know uh you know tied up in, 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 in you know it's too important to sort of back down so yes there was a, a but and there was a case of uh, yeah what what could do what could you know take the fight to to a, a you know a, a, a determined sasquatch and there were the, the, the candidate list is fairly short so. yes <laughs> um, yeah, uh, but it, what again? The challenge that I had there was, uh, you know, whereas I can rationalise and create a biological, you know, uh, sort of you know niche and reason for there being a Bigfoot, this particular cryptid is very difficult to explain from a pure zoological point of view. Um, but again, I've always had a, uh, I've always had a, a fascination with it, um, and you know some of the accounts of, you know, uh, you know joints popping and things like that, which just, you know, if you're making it up, why would you include it? You know, sort of, you know, yeah. sort of stuff. It's a really interesting stuff to add, and people who know what we're talking about will know that that's just <laughs> giving it away. But, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I, I won't leave any more. Uh, pleased with that but yes uh, yeah she, she has help in the end to yes. a certain extent yeah it's amazing how many people misidentify bears with a variety of cryptids isn't it, it oh it really <laughs> is yes is, uh, absolutely well i was telling somebody at work i was like i said yeah because i was trying to not show given that i work for an animal charity i was trying to show that i wasn't completely insane um <laughs> and and, and, uh, and was uh, saying well you know if you obviously if you you know show a map of bigfoot sightings and look at that and then overlay it with a map of you know what we know is to black to be black bear habitat it does you know surprisingly match up you know, yeah rather well but mm. but not perfectly so. <laughs> yes yeah plus plus we had that uh that survey from uh from someone uh, was it earlier this year where they were saying oh yeah everybody that's seen a bigfoot they've, they've accidentally seen a, a black bear and i just thought that you can only make that decision if you do not look at the reports and just look at someone seeing Bigfoot here, because when you look at the reports, they're clearly not bears. Uh, 
I, I don't. Yeah, I mean, either these people have no ability to to explain what they've seen because what they're what they're what they're describing is is completely wrong. So if they're describing a bear, their ability to describe something is is fairly off. Yes. Um, but 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 also. Bears have now become that familiar animal. I mean, you know, the, the amount of people who adamantly go, it was not a bear. I know what a bear looks like. I'd seen bears the day before in Yellowstone or, mm. you know, California or wherever they were, you know. Um, and, he, you know, my sister lives in, in California and she, she saw a black bear the other day. You know, so for a, a Brit living in California is, is kind of, you know, you know, it, 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 you know it, it, it's not an unusual it's not an unusual sight. It does happen, mm. and I think. And again, I think it's very, very arrogant to to tell people that they they, had, they didn't see what they say they saw. Mm. You know, uh, and again, a lot of the people who are doing it, um, you know, are very comfortable in armchairs. You know, in their proverbial you know mother's basements. Um, you know, which is you know a little a little harsh, but but it but that is the case. Most of the people. You know, I'm a very keen hiker, I'm a very keen wildlife watcher. I've had experiences in the UK and the US of things that I cannot explain, uh, you know, including a, a campground in, in America, um, you know, uh, that are very odd. Um, you know, I couldn't tell you what I saw because I didn't actually see anything, but I heard some weird stuff. Mm. You know, so. Indeed, and I think often I would rather listen to somebody that spent 30 years in the woods hunting than somebody who says no that person's an idiot yes I, I absolutely and and again i think that's what's really interesting about the reports and, and and something we really need to take into consideration is that a lot of these people who are genuinely you know come forward and, and give a report uh, and obviously hoaxing is a thing and of you course know, it happens and and there's you know I, I, I you know on a show not too long ago i you know there was a guy who Apparently, you know, jujitsued his way through three Bigfoot, which I find, you know, um, astonishing. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's up there. It's up there with the uh, samurai sword killing alien hunter. Yeah, uh, uh, I mean, I don't want to say. I mean, as I say, we've got no evidence. We don't know what these things are capable of, or, or you know, or what happens and. I, I I don't want to call anyone a liar, but as I say, I I, I work for, in conservation. I am one of the animals we work with is chimpanzees, yes. and I know what an aggressive single chimpanzee can do if it's so inclined. Yep. Um, and you know to, to suggest that you can take on three three apes, let's call them apes, with karate moves is 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 a is a serious claim. And I'd work, yeah, and a bit like in Sherlock Holmes talk, uh, you know, and again Sherlock Holmes gets referenced in the book because yes. he's a favourite. Uh, but the more fantastical uh, uh, you know uh, uh, a claim, the more fantastical the evidence has to be. And I don't I don't think that's something we should shy away from. But at the same time, you know, as a the amount of, you know, interviews, reports and things like that that you've got where people, they're not seeking fame and they're not telling it in a way that is grandiose or flamboyant. They're telling it in a way that is basically therapy because they need, they need to talk to somebody and they've experienced serious trauma. Yeah. I think it's, it's really difficult to tell that, you know, to turn around and say, oh, okay, I don't believe in Bigfoot because, you know, when you hear those accounts, I I think anyone who turns around and to those people and says I I, I think you're wrong I, I kind of think shame on you really because yeah. it, it's very difficult to tell people they haven't seen what they've seen you know and and very wrong I think mm. yeah very much so well Luke it's a phenomenal piece of work I absolutely love it uh, it it is one of the best non fiction books uh, what am i talking about it's one of the best <laughs> yeah complete that well for me it's it's a true story um no, it's well, what... <laughs> well, like it, it does uh you know i deliberately do weave the, the non-fiction in there so uh but you're yeah so you're very kind and i'm very happy to call it a non-fiction book uh, if it if it sells more but uh, I, I i i i should probably say i should probably say it well it's a bit like you know when you see in the movie when you say based on true events which yes. you know very very loosely so <laughs> Absolutely. But, but it could happen. Excellent. I can't wait for the sequel. I have to say it's uh, this book should be here. We are coming up to Christmas. Anybody that loves cryptids, mysteries, thrillers, this book has it all. It's amazing. 
anybody that loves Bigfoot will love this. It's worth buying just to find out what the mystery cryptid is that we've been dancing around. And um, I think so. Yes, absolutely, <laughs> Luke. I concur. So the sequel will be coming down the line. Is this is this going to be sooner rather than later then, Luke? Yeah, well, with the last two books, Phantom Beast and Rogue, I pretty much wrote them back to back and was able to get them out you know, sort of, you know, within a year of each other. So um, I am attempting to do the same with, because the, the Beast books are still, you know, I still have a very loyal reader base there. And, um, you know, they want to see that the next in that series, which is Predatory Nature. But um, Rogue has taken off in a way that uh, I couldn't possibly contemplate. Um, and there are <clears throat> characters that I've introduced, like Nina and, uh, you know, Agents Smith and Jones, <laughs> who I had a lot of fun with. I mean, it's really interesting because when I start, it's a bit like Truman Capote said, when you cannot blame, um, you know, a, a, a writer for things the characters do. Because when I started writing the book, Jones in particular was a villain. He was an absolute villain and he was going to be the bad guy. And in the story, he evolved very quickly into this sort of anti hero, almost father figure, um, you know, for, for both Nina and the soldiers. And yeah, so I, I've had a lot of fun. And, you know, with his backstory and with Nina's backstory, there's, the, and particularly the two of the soldiers who are from Louisiana, we've got places to go and I'm, I'm very keen to, 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 to go there. So yeah, the, they are are in the works now and if i'm disciplined then you know again perhaps this time next year or maybe a little bit beyond that we, we could be looking at the sequel so fabulous well luke congratulations on a on another brilliant book every since i've got to know you i've followed your work i love what you do you're a you're a lovely chap and i wish you all the very best of luck with this like we've said rogue has really taken off it's done phenomenally well already it's only been out a month so where can everybody get a hold of a copy and follow your work going forwards luke uh, so yeah it's uh, available on amazon in both paperback and uh, on kindle um if you're a member of kindle unlimited you can borrow the book it's available there and if you're in the us you can also order it in any good bookshop and i i luke phillips or black beast books um we, you can contact me on facebook and on instagram you know, and uh, very happy to you know talk to people i've got some you know lovely readers we, we talk all the time we throw ideas around and and uh you know so uh, very happy to answer questions and, and talk to people um, it's it's one of the, it's, it's you know it's the, one of the bits of the job that all authors like so yeah we, I, i'd love to hear from people fabulous well i'll put links to everything in the show notes as always luke and once again thank you again thank you for writing such a bloody good book i've absolutely uh, loved it i can't wait to read it again and pick all the bits i missed the first time and uh i just wish you the best of luck with it and hopefully we'll speak again soon my friend and have a lovely christmas yes you too paul thank you very much and it's very much two-way street you know love the shows and, and the in-depth of the interviews um you know I, th I think as you know andy mcgrath said in his view um you know it has become the podcast that sets the standard in terms of the, of the subject matter so um you know hats off to yourself you know because you know, you are uh, an inspiration so really appreciate it paul thank you for so much you are too kind your your check is in the post <laughs> take care luke thank you thank you paul 